it over to you. Good afternoon. This last week, Sherry and I were traveling and as we were on the road, I started getting sleepy. Some of the medicines I'm on make me very drowsy. And so I reached over into the side door where I had a five hour energy drink and I took it out and it's got a little plastic wrapper around it. And so I handed it to Sherry and I said, can you unwrap this for me? And she did and handed it back to me. Well, to be extra helpful, she took the cap off. Well, I didn't realize she took the cap off and I thought to myself, surely this needs to be shaken. And so <laughs> I thought, uh, since I had one hand on the wheel, I thought I'll just tap it on my chest. And uh, I flung five hour energy drink all over the van and it woke me up. And so <laughs> I can say to you that those really do work. I want to begin with a question this afternoon, and it is this. Are you a better prayer today than you were a year ago? Are you a better prayer today than you were when you first became a Christian? Have you grown in your life as it relates to prayer? You know, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass that he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, and when he ceased, one of the disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Not long ago, there was a sister in Christ, I guess in her late 80s, and she came to me and she said, Don, I need help knowing how to pray. She said, I just don't feel like God is answering my prayers. She said, I don't know what to say. You ever feel that way? I certainly have felt that way. My assignment this hour is 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, where the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Now, our first point this afternoon is going to be, what does it mean to pray without ceasing? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible says about the early Christians, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. They prayed steadfastly. That means regularly, continuously. Brethren assembled together and they prayed publicly. In Matthew chapter 14, after feeding the 5,000, the Bible says that Jesus sent the multitude away and he went into the mountain apart to pray. Matthew 14, 23. What does that mean? He prayed privately. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his apostles, Sit ye here while I go yonder and pray. Matthew 26, 36. And so Christians prayed together. Christians need to pray privately. Christians need time alone, away from the cares and the interruptions of the world, in private devotion to God. Daniel would leave his secular responsibilities three times a day and go to his room to pray. Certainly, to pray without ceasing means that we pray with the brethren publicly. Certainly, it means that we're going to have times of private devotion in prayer. But I think it means more than that. I want you to consider this with me from Nehemiah chapter 2. There's something that we learn about, in fact, several things we learn about prayer in that chapter. Now, Nehemiah, of course, was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. He would bring the drink to the king and he would test it, ensure that it was safe before the king would drink. On this particular occasion, when Nehemiah comes into the presence of the king, the king senses that something is wrong and he says, why the sad countenance? Nehemiah says, I was so afraid. That is when you come into the presence of the king and he says, what's wrong with you? He said, I was very careful to answer. But listen to what he says. Chapter 2 and verse 4 of Nehemiah, Nehemiah says this, so I prayed the God of heaven, and I said unto the king. How long was that prayer? Two seconds? Five seconds? Ten seconds? Do you think he closed his eyes? Do you think he got down on his knees, folded his hands? Brethren, I learned something important about prayer from Nehemiah, and that is some prayers last only seconds. Some prayers I don't close my eyes for. I think I learned something about what it means to pray without ceasing, and that is, as a child of God, I can constantly be talking to Him 
in prayer. And so there are prayers, of course, that are public. There are prayers that take extended periods of private devotion, but there's a constant communication where I reach out to the Father in prayer. Of course, they're also going to, though that's a very short prayer, there are also going to be prayers that are much longer. Of course, the night before the crucifixion, Jesus spent a good portion of that night in prayer. The church apparently was involved in a lengthy prayer session on behalf of Peter when he was in prison. And so the length of my prayer is going to vary based on the things that are facing me in life. It's going to vary depending on my blessings and my bruises and my triumphs and my temptations. But throughout life, I'm constantly going to be involved in prayer. You know, we sing the song sometimes, pray in the morning, pray in the noontime, pray in the evening, pray all the time. Here's the second point. Why don't we pray without ceasing. On March the si- or May the 6th of this year, it will mark three years since I became a paraplegic. That particular day changed everything for me and for Sherry. I believe that most people consider that day to be the day that I lost my ability to walk, but it has been so much more than that. It was the day that was the beginning of daily pain, both physical and even more so emotional. It was the beginning of inabilities, financial burdens, constant doctor's visits, many things that are too embarrassing even to talk about. While I was in the hospital, those days were filled with rehab. That's what this picture is, uh, rehab that I was having in the hospital. You can tell by the look on my face that it was not pleasant. I had training, I had classes during the day. My family was with me all day long, but in the evenings they would leave and I was there alone in room 504 and I was left to ponder my future, what was going to be ahead of me, to talk to God in prayer. And I recall on one particular evening that I was laying in the bed and I was praying and I was begging the Lord for me to be able to walk again. I got my phone out that night and I posted on Facebook asking others to do the same thing. But day by day passed and nothing happened. And I want to tell you that that lack of response shook me. It seemed like I was making a reasonable request. I mean, I had had previously been out traveling on a regular basis, not vacationing. I'd been out traveling and preaching. Being able-bodied seemed like it was helping the cause of Christ, but nothing was happening. And I'm ashamed to tell you that it caused me to doubt. And so for that reason, this topic is a very real topic to me. And I wonder, why isn't God answering my prayer? Have you ever felt that way? You know, through the years, many of God's servants have felt this struggle I want you to look at some of these I've listed here. Think about the words of Job in Job 23 and verse 8. Job says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth him on the right hand, that I cannot see him. That is, where is the Lord? I can't find him. David poured out his heart and he said, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart every day? That is, he said, why are you hiding from me? I can't find you. Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, O Lord, how how long shall I cry and you will not hear me? So where are you, Lord? It doesn't seem like you're answering me. I'm crying and you are not hearing me. The question that I'm answering here is, why do we not always pray to God without ceasing? I mentioned to you this 90-year-old sister who said, I need help praying. She said, I don't feel like God is answering my prayers. Brethren, I am convinced that many of us struggle in our prayer lives to keep praying because we don't feel like it's doing any good. We don't feel like God is answering our prayers. Now, before I get to the meat of answering this question, I want to share with you something that has helped me. It's in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 22. John the Baptist is in prison. He's soon to be beheaded. 
And the text says, And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? I have asked myself, why in the world would John the Baptist ask that question? John is the one who by inspiration announced him. He is the one who introduced him to Israel at his baptism. I have read numerous commentators about this. Why did John do this? Brethren, could it be, could it be that even John needed reassurance? You know, I've thought much about this. Jesus said, among those born of women, there's not one greater than John the Baptist. Could it be that the Holy Spirit recorded this for the rest of us who struggle to show us that even the best of men sometimes need assurance? All right, I want to tackle this question, and I want to address something that I believe is at the root of why many people don't pray without ceasing, and that is this question... Why doesn't God answer my prayers? I want to go through several answers to this. Number one, sometimes God is not answering my prayers, at least not in the affirmative, because it's really not in my best interest for that prayer to be answered. I want you to consider the words of Romans chapter 8, 26 and verse 27. The Bible says, "...likewise the Spirit also helps our weaknesses." For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now this is a deep study. I know that there are various views about this. But I want you to consider with me the words of verse 26 where he says, We do not know what we should pray for as we ought. What is Paul talking about in this passage? May I suggest to you that first in our prayer lives, oftentimes we don't know what to pray for as we ought because we don't have a knowledge of the future. Does not Solomon say in Proverbs 27 and verse 1, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring? But such is not the case with God. I don't know what the future holds, so that hinders me in always knowing what I ought to pray. Secondly, in my prayer life, I oftentimes don't know what to pray because I don't have an accurate knowledge concerning what is even best for me. Listen to the words of Moses Lard. He says in his commentary on Romans, Our weakness and ignorance in this life are so great that in many respects, possibly as a rule, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. We want many things that it may be pray for them, which were they granted would prove our greatest misfortune. While we do not want and do not ask for many things, which would be our greatest blessings. Here then is ignorance as to what we should pray for. Confessedly then, we are weak and we need help. Perhaps Solomon gave a summation of the point that we're seeking to make when he says this in Ecclesiastes 6, 11, and 12. He says, For who knows what is good for a man in this life all the days of this vain life which he spends as a shadow? For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? So what I'm suggesting is this. When it comes to my prayer life, I don't always know what to pray because I don't know the future. I don't necessarily know what is even best for me. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, Paul prayed three times that his thorn in the flesh would be removed. Now, I don't know what the thorn in the flesh is. Nobody does. But Paul believed that it would be in his best interest for it to be removed, and he asked repeatedly for this. But in verse number 9, the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And verse number 7 says that this thorn was given lest he should be exalted above measure. Now what's the point I'm making? Paul was pleading for something that he believed was in his best interest, but God said it is not in his best interest. Now think about this. By not answering his prayer, it was going to keep him humble so he would not be exalted. His strength was perfected in his weakness. Brethren, this is what I'm getting at. Sometimes suffering and painful things make me better. 
They make me stronger. They make me a more capable servant of the Lord. And so sometimes I'm disturbed and even upset because God isn't answering my prayer when in reality He's not answering because He's looking out for my best interest. When I can learn that, it helps me grow with regard to my prayer life. It has certainly helped me to, to ponder this. Number two, sometimes God is not answering my prayer because it may be that it doesn't fit God's plan. Now let me give you some examples of what I'm talking about. In Luke 22 and verse 41, the Bible says about Jesus that He knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if it is Your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. Then an angel appeared unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Mark 14 and verse 39 says, And again he went, and he prayed, and he spake the same words. Matthew 26, 44 says, And he left them, and he went away again. And he prayed the third time, saying the same words. Brethren, this was a cry of the Lord showing His humanity, asking for deliverance. He prayed it earnestly. He prayed it in agony. He prayed it repeatedly, but the answer was no. Why? Because the will of the Father needed to be done. Brethren, this has brought to my mind the question, could it be that sometimes I'm praying for relief but there's something more important in the mind of God. Could it be that there are souls that could be reached if I remain in this condition? I'm thinking about ending my pain, but the Lord is thinking about opportunities. He's thinking about His providence. He's thinking about people that I might could reach. Maybe there's someone that I can take the truth to providentially and they will learn the truth from me because of the situation. Maybe there's a hard heart who can only be touched by my situation. Maybe someone will be encouraged to persevere because of my situation. I want to share with you a Facebook message that I got. In fact, I can't read it and it has not popped up here. Let's see, can you read it there? Okay. I posted this uh, back in August of last year. I frequently get discouraged by my condition and I think to myself, nobody has it as bad as I do. And then I ponder my blessings and I think to myself, nobody has it as good as I do. Count your blessings. After I posted this, Brother Charles Warren wrote this. He said, I think about it a lot too. But just think if it wasn't for the accident, we never would have met. It changed my life when you and Aaron Gallagher shared the gospel with me. After my accident, Brother Charles Warren was one of the contractors who came to remodel my bathroom. We taught him the gospel. He's a faithful Christian down in South Mississippi now. He is teaching. He's conducting studies. He is very active in that congregation. And when I think about that, I think if he makes it to the day of judgment and is found faithful, then it's all been worth it. And so I'm worried about walking, but God is concerned about this man who's seeking the truth. You know, the promise is, if you'll seek, you will find. So here's a man who's a contractor. He remodels bathrooms for handicapped people. I'm a gospel preacher. I've recently become handicapped. And it could be that providentially the Lord's using this situation and it's so it fits his plan not that he put me in this situation I don't believe that but he certainly can use it you know I would recommend to you this book by brother Dan Winkler I have read it and it has helped me he suggests in this book that when we pray the father inclines his ear toward us based on Psalm 86. The Hebrew word here for inclines carries with it the idea of stretching out, bending over, or bowing toward. Quite literally, when I pray, God leans toward me to listen. Secondly, when I pray, the Son is sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for me, Hebrews 7.25. He's defending me. He's speaking on my behalf. 
Thirdly, the Holy Spirit is interceding. We just noticed Romans 8, 26 and verse 27. And so I have gotten now to when I pray, I envision what's going on in heaven. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit actively engaging, leaning, listening, defending, interceding. And it has caused me to have more confidence in prayer than I ever have before. Here's the next one. I think, why is God not answering my prayer? I want to suggest to you that maybe I'm just not recognizing the answer to my prayer. Years ago, an older gospel preacher, I remember him saying, if you don't want adversity, he said, be careful when you pray for patience. And I thought I understood the point, and that is the answer to my prayer may not come in the form that I expected it. In fact, I might not even recognize the answer to my prayer. I want you to consider this. As the Apostle Paul opens the book of Romans, he says to them, Romans 1, 13 through 15, Now I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. That is, Paul said, I want to come to you who are in Rome. I am desirous to come to you. Paul's intention, Paul's desire was to go to Rome. He eventually does go to Rome. Do you think it's the way he had in mind? God's, God answered his desire and took him there, but it involved being arrested. It involved some prison time, a shipwreck, a snake bite, and a lot of other things along the ways. Sometimes God is granting to me, but not in any form that I remotely imagined. It could be that God is answering my prayer, but with my limited understanding, I don't even see it. I think, why is God not answering my prayer? And maybe it's not that the answer is no. Maybe it's that the answer is not yet. You know, our tendency is to make a request to God and if it isn't answered within the week, I think the answer is no, and I quit. And we grumble to God, God, why don't you answer my prayer? You know, we've used the illustration many times, but it appropriately uh, makes the point. In Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham that he'd be the father of many nations. Abraham is 75 years old at that time. When we reach Genesis chapter 15, times passed, Abraham still has no children, and he prays, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? That is, Lord, what are we going to do about this? But the child doesn't come until Genesis 21, when Abraham is 100 years old. That's 25 years. I'm upset if it doesn't get answered in the week. We can't forget one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. People say crazy things about that passage, but what that means is time is irrelevant to God. If God promised it a thousand years ago, it's the same as if He promised it yesterday. Here's the next. Sometimes God doesn't answer prayer. I want you to get this, because God doesn't answer prayer for a man who's living in sin or a man who refuses him. Now, I'm thinking in this point about people who are in the world. I know this would be shocking to people in the world. People have the idea that they can live in sin. They live in open rebellion to God. And when they find themselves in a pinch, they call on God to bail them out. Solomon describes a man like that in Proverbs chapter 1, 24 through 30. Listen to what he says, Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded... Listen to verse 28. God says, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Why is that? Because Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says, Your sin has separated between you and God. I could say a lot more about that, but let me move on to this next point. God also won't answer the prayer of a Christian who has departed from him and is living in sin. David, of course, was a child. He wasn't a Christian. He was a child of God under the old law. Psalm 66 and verse 18, David said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Sometimes you might have a Christian who is living in sin, and yet when he gets in a pinch, he wants to approach God in prayer as if everything is okay. 
Sometimes Christians will ignore plain passages of Scripture. They come to worship as if everything is all right and God's going to be okay with that. Let me give you some examples of this. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has ought against you, leave there your gift at the altar, go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, then bring your gift to the altar. What is he saying? You've got this issue with your brother that needs to be taken care of. Take care of it before you worship God. Why? Because your worship's not going to get any higher to the ceiling than when you've got this sin that's not resolved. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe you haven't sinned against your brother. Maybe your brother sinned against you. Luke 17 and verse 3, If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Sometimes we don't want to do that. Sometimes we don't want to rebuke him. Sometimes we don't want to forgive him. And we want to go and pretend everything is okay. And I'm going to go to God in prayer, and I'm going to ask God, forgive me, but I won't forgive my brother. He said he won't do that. Here's the next one. God won't answer a prayer that is used as a substitute for work. Now listen to this. This is very common. Oftentimes men will lead a prayer that's a substitute for work. We'll say something like this, Lord, please take the gospel to the lost. And then we don't make any effort to take the gospel to the lost. We think that we've done our duty because we prayed that. In actuality, what we've done is said a vain prayer. The Lord expects us to pray, but He also expects us to work. Think about this with regard to our food. Does the Bible teach we should pray for our food? Yes, Matthew 6 and verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. And yet Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, if a man won't work, neither should he eat. We think about the purity of the, the church. Lord, please help this church to be pure. But then we ignore some of the things the Lord said we need to do to keep the church pure. You think about the gospel. Lord, somehow may the gospel go into the world. Lord, somehow may they do that. You know, Colossians chapter 4, 2, and 3, Paul prayed for the Colossian, or Paul told the Colossian brethren to pray that a door would be opened that they might speak the gospel, but still he went. Right? Pray for that door, and then you go for that door. We have the command to take the gospel into all of the world. Here's the next one. God won't answer a prayer that is asked with the wrong motives. Brethren, this is an easy thing, I believe, for us to fall into, to pray with the wrong motives. When we do that, it becomes an empty and a powerless, vain prayer. You say, what are some of these motives? One would be selfishness. You know, James chapter 4 and verse 3, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. I tell you what, God doesn't care who wins the football game. It drives me crazy when I hear brethren praying about that. How about this one? How about this motive? How about pride? You think there can be pride involved in prayer? Matthew 6 and verse 5, Jesus said, And when you pray, don't be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. You think about these people who are religious leaders, and they are praying to be seen of men. Now you think, well, that's amazing. How could that possibly be taking place? Could that happen with preaching? Could we preach to be seen of men and have our egos stroked? Could I get up and quote long passages of Scripture just so that men could come to me and say, Oh, Brother Don, you've got a great memory. You see, any of these things we could fall into and do for the wrong reasons. I'm getting long here. Let me move on to this next point. For what should I pray without ceasing? Now, I'm just going to give you some things very quickly. Number one, my prayer life should include praise. In the model prayer, how did Jesus begin? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is a phrase of praise. Praise to God is the first remark in Jesus' prayer. And brethren, it ought to be an integral part of our lives. Oftentimes, I'm afraid our prayer lives, at least I can say about mine, I can't speak to yours, but sometimes it is easy to fall into the trap of being overwhelmingly focused on myself. Lord, forgive me. Lord, please strengthen me. Lord, please help me. My prayer life 
needs to spend time focusing on God. Psalm 150 and verse 2, praise Him according to His excellent greatness. If you need help in this, read the Psalms. Number two, I need to pray for my brethren. 1 Samuel and verse 12, Samuel rebukes the people of God for their sin. And verse 19, the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto God that we die not. Now listen to 1 Samuel 12 and verse 23. Samuel's response is this, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for my brethren. He says, I would be sinning if I'm not praying for my brethren. Now what am I going to pray for my brethren? I need to pray for their spirituality, Colossians 1, 9, 2 Thessalonians 1, 11. I need to pray for the work that they're doing, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. I need to pray for physical ailments. I need to pray for their hardships, Acts chapter 12. I need to give thanksgiving for the brethren. Philippians 1 and verse 3, Paul said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for your fellowship in the gospel. Next. I need to have thanksgiving as a part of my prayer life. Colossians 4 and verse 2, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 teaches us that a thankless society is the mark of a people who have left God. How often do we thank God for answering our prayers? Maybe I'm up all night pouring out my heart in God, praying for someone, and that prayer is answered. Do I go back and take the time to thank God for answering? I know this is the kind of stuff that we've heard, but do, do we put that into practice and think about that? You make a prayer list. Do you make a list of things God has answered? You know, sometimes we might be like uh, the ten lepers in Luke 17. All of them asked for a blessing. All of them received the blessing. Nine of them never came back and thanked Him for the blessing. And the Lord noted that. Philippians 4 and verse 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. I need to thank God for the remission of my sins, for the church, for the sacrifice of Christ, physical blessings, answered prayers. We can go on and on. Is that five minutes? Five minutes. Okay. I need to pray for the lost. I heard a brother in Christ suggest that we should not pray for the lost. That was the strangest thing I had ever heard. Paul prayed for the lost. Romans 10 and 1, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1 says that prayer should be made for all men. And right after that in verse 4 he says that God will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Next, I need to pray for the church, for the spread of the gospel, that the Lord's will be, may be done. Matthew 6 and verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now the kingdom has come. We don't pray that now, but we pray for the spread of the kingdom. Do you pray for your local congregation by name? Lord, be with the Willow Avenue Church of Christ. Call your elders by name. Call your preacher by name, individual members. I have observed in the times that I have focused especially on praying for the church by name, it seems like it has been our most prosperous times. We need to pray for those who are sick and suffering infirmity, James 5.15. We need to pray for forgiveness of ourselves, Matthew 6.12, 1 John 1.9. 1, for those who are penitent, James 5.16. We need to pray for our daily needs. We need to pray for strength in time of temptation. I'm going through this quickly. It's in the book. I'm running out of time. We need to pray for the government. Oh, we need to pray for the government right now. 1 Timothy 2. We're to pray for kings and all of them that are in authority. If we have ever had a president who needs prayers, it is the one we currently have. Someone has given this list of things for which we should pray. Church events, elders, preachers, deacons, weak and erring members, church growth, local and worldwide, church programs not covered under the deacons, the youth of the church, shut-ins, nursing homes, widows, missionaries, lost people connected to our congregation, new converts, community outreach, the bereaved, brotherhood issues, Christian education, Bible school, children, that the church enter not into temptation, the sick, and the list goes on and on and on. Let me read you this and I'm going to wrap this up. I got up early this morning and I rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish 
that I didn't have time to pray. Temptations were poured out upon me till I thought that I couldn't last, and I wondered why God wouldn't help me. Then I remembered I hadn't asked. I needed strength from my master, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I wondered why he didn't give me. Then I remembered I didn't seek. Satan was warring upon me much more with each tick of the clock. I wondered why God didn't help me. He said, child, why didn't you knock? I got up early this morning, and I paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish. I had to take time to pray. When you see this long list, which I did not even complete, you can see why the child of God must pray without ceasing. Thank you for your good attention. I appreciate it.